Okay, so we want to start. So, uh, Grace is in Europe this week, and so we are going to say a few things uh, to introduce Pamela. Um, so, earlier today I went to Pamela's office and we decided that I would say the fewest words possible. So, everybody knows that she works at ISR, she does a wonderful job, and if you want to see her many, many accomplishments, please visit her webpage. And today she does all about bio tips. How's that? Okay, perfect. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, I'll, I'll start by just reinforcing that and saying that the Institute for Systems Research has been um, part of the intellectual fabric of my life at Maryland since I've been here, and it's been really important to um, both the work that I've done and the environment that I've done it in, and um, I can't imagine what I've done here happening without the support and resources and genu genu general community of the Institute for Systems Research. So I think this is a very special place, and I thank you all for being part of it. Um, so just to get started, um, I wanted to um, just kind of talk um, about, you know, kind of my approach to um, taking inspiration from biological systems. Um, I don't want to kind of be the horse here and devote a lot of time to saying how great biological systems are in specific examples. Um, many people over the past decades have done that and shown time and again how biological systems are operating at or near physical limits of, you know, physical limits in many different domains, depending on the system, depending on how you look at it, depending on how you measure it. Um, so we'll just take that as a, as a, as a baseline and starting point, that biological systems provide that inspiration that they have a very high performance for very limited resources. And there's this group of concept that we'd like to get to in the kinds of technologies that we can engineer and design. Um, and so what I'd like to spend the time today focusing on is what lessons we can learn from biology. And I'll generally divide those into three different areas. One is just developing better ways for us to communicate with biology, to understand what biology is doing in an electronic system context, um, learning lessons from biology so that we can allow engineered technologies to become better and to incorporate some of the lessons that we can learn from biology, like adaptation and learning, and um, also trying to apply some of the lessons that we might learn from understanding the very low power um, operation that many biological systems um, exhibit. So, um, so first I'll focus on how we can use integrated circuits and sensors to tell what cells are doing. Um, so, you know, the, this is kind of obviously organized around the kinds of sensors that we work on, but generally speaking, you know, for several decades, people have been studying, for, for many decades, okay, for a long time, people have been studying the electrical activity of cells, um, and even the electrical activity of single cells in a neuroscience context for, for many decades. Um, but now there are kind of many opportunities for doing that um, with a kind of very dense, almost seamless interface to, um, to electronic systems. Um, also kind of beyond, you know, a very small subset of cells actually are electrically active per se. And so you'd like to be able to also detect other interesting properties of cells like things like whether they're healthy, whether there are cells there, what maybe some of the more specific properties of cells are that you might be able to get through um, fluorescence, for example. And so here are some examples of kind of sensors that we've worked on. Um, clearly you use something like a, amp a bio amp an amplifier, a bioamplifier to be able to detect electrical activity or um, cells that produce electrical activity. Um, uh, capacitance sensors we've um, shown um, detecting things that are similar to the health of cells. Um, uh, we've used basically CMOS cameras to tell whether cells are present or not in a microfluidic system, and um, fluorescent sensors to detect a, a number of interesting properties of cells. So I'll talk about each of these modalities briefly. Uh, the first one being electrical activity, and people have done this for a while. Um, you know, basically, um, so these are this, these are showing. Um, cow heart cells, spikes produced by cow heart cells, but basically neurons and muscle cells um, in your body or when you take them out of your body produce spikes. And this is kind of what that, that activity looks like. Um, there are two general approaches for that detection, both of which we're pursuing um, 
in an active project here in Maryland, um, using active chips underneath a population of cells to be able to pick up that activity, as well as more passive arrays um, where you could just pick up that activity using external instrumentation. Um, both of these approaches require that you get really good coupling with your cells and that the cells have pretty good health for um, producing that electrical activity. Um, all, the, the distinction between these two approaches is that the active approach um, requires you to figure out ways to put active circuits, chips, into relatively nasty environments for chips to be in. So it requires that you actually get, this, get the chips into the right place and requires that you develop techniques for packaging them. Um, the passive approach, the packaging constraints are not as dramatic, not, you know, not as dramatic and much more relaxed. Um, but it means that all of the stuff that the active circuits are doing have to be done externally by external, um, external components. Um, generally speaking, um, the, so the active approach is what I'm going to focus on here because um, that active approach um, essentially allows a much, uh, at least eventually, allows a much denser um, monitoring of um, the cell activity in a, in a culture environment uh, because you can have you know, say switching, addressing, to be able to get to very small sites. Whereas in a passive approach, you're always limited by your, your fan in and fan out in your passive array. Um, you're limited by the, the, just the 2D wiring to get to your electrode sites. Okay, um, so the active approach here is really just using an amplifier. Um, I'd just like to point out that the, the basic amplifier that most people in this community doing this kind of monitoring using active microelectrode arrays um, are using this basic um, structure developed by Reed Har Harrison, who was one of our microsystems um, seminar speakers this semester here um, in the Institute for Systems Research. Um, the basic idea is that you have, uh, so uh, these kinds of electri um, electrical signals, these extracellular signals produced by cells, are pretty small, oops, that should be microvolts instead of millivolts. Um, they have a, an unknown DC offset that's due to, you know, the, the pH of the medium, the state of the electrode, um, and a frequency range generally in the range of 100 hertz to 5 or 10 millihertz. Um, the approach that this, so what this circuit really does is it allows, it provides a capacitance um, in the feedback path that will hold that offset for you. Um, at the same time, this provides a high resistive path that allows you to define the common mode and set a low frequency roll off of the circuit. Um, we've used this basic approach um, in many different CMOS processes, ultra cells on top. You can see a picture here of cells on top of one of these, um, one of these circuits, or these electrodes connected to one of, one of these circuits, um, and use this to detect activity. Okay. Um, another one of those modalities that I mentioned before is capacitance sensing. Um, capacitance sensing, um, the, the origin of that came from talking to cell biologists. And generally speaking, when you talk to cell biologists and ask them, how do you tell what's going on with the cell? They say, well, you look at it. You see whether it's healthy or not healthy. <laughs> you see how it's responding to some sort of treatment. And so then you say, okay, well, how do you tell whether a cell is healthy or not? And, uh, you know, generally speaking, um, at least for a large class of cells, you tell whether a cell is healthy or not by looking at how well attached it is to its substrate. Okay, whether it's nice and strongly attached to the substrate and spread out so that you can almost barely see it, or whether it's all balled up and trying to get out of there at any cost whatsoever. And so you think, aha, okay, that sounds like capacitance. Sounds like capacitance, smells like capacitance, let's measure the capacitance. And so, um, that, sub that substrate attachment and capacitive coupling with the substrate turns out to be a very sensitive indicator for that cell morphology. Um, that cell morphology indicates a lot of different things about um, the cell behavior and properties. It turns out that unhealthy cells are really weakly adherent to their substrates, and healthy cells are, 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 are adhered much more strongly to their substrates. And so we've shown in you know, a number of test structures, a number of experiments, a number of settings, that these kinds of capacitance measurements correlate with cell adhesion, with viability, with proliferation. So you're essentially just detecting, you know, in the very, very close area near the surface of the sensor, you're detecting changes in the dielectric properties that are due to the cell actually attaching itself really strongly to the surface or not. Okay, so 
had a whole bunch of data here, but I've, I've limited it to one so that you get through some more, some more, some more material. Anyway, um, so this is just one example of that kind of study that shows an experiment where we. Um, so these are on three different sensors. These have to be three different size sensors, which doesn't really matter here. Um, but what you see is an initial sedimentation and adhesion process where the cells, after being placed on the chip, where the cells settle down onto the chip and you know, start being healthy and happy. And um, what we're doing here is actually with this sample and this sample, we've um, compared the metabolic activity of the cell. We're using the capacitance sensor here to indicate, we're, we're trying to see if it correlates with metabolic activity. And so these samples are actually drawn to indicate how metabolically active the cells are. And it's using a particular kind of um, you know, dye called alumar blue. And so this number indicates that the cells are very happy, very healthy, very happy, very metabolically active. Over here, not so much. And you can see a pretty dramatic decline in the capacitance that correlates strongly with that, that measure of cell health. Okay. So, so uh, we, I, sh I should mention, we've also shown things like proliferation. Yeah, Sarah, sorry. What's the little dip that happened? The little dip, the little dip is actually just an artifact from sampling. So it's not a cell health issue. Yeah, that's, that's, not a, that's not a cell health, health issue. It's, a, it's just an artifact from sampling. Because it's a pretty small volume that you're drawing the sample from. Sorry, Peter. What is the media that these cells are in during these tests? Um, that's a good question. Um, this is um, time in 30 hours. OK, growth medium. So just regular growth medium, but, but with the Alamar Blue in it. Alamar Blue has the property of being blue to start, and then as the cells metabolize it, it slowly turns pink. And so it's, it can be used as either a fluorometric or spectro, spectrophotometric assay for cell metabolism. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's one, of, one of the few measurements that you can actually correlate with this in a pointwise basis. Many of the um, fluorometric assays for cell health are endpoint assays, so you actually can only do it by getting all the cells out of there, grinding them up, and then doing some other manipulations. So you can't, you can't have a kind of continuous tracking. Um, okay, so I wanted to switch to one of the other modalities, which is contact imaging. Um, the, the idea here was basically, can we just tell the cells are there using a camera underneath? You know, this is just projection imaging the cells. And um, so what I'm showing here is just, um, so what you've got here is a contact image acquired from just a CMOS camera stuck underneath the cells, and it, a, 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 a photomicrograph acquired through a microscope. Um, you know, the cells are packaged along the lines of this, they were just packaged using um, polymers that we found didn't absorb too much water, and so they would let us get some measurements of anywhere between a day and seven days, depending on conditions. <laughs> um, and so this is a this is a comparison on the left between beads, and on the right this is in um, this is with um, I believe these were bovine aortic smooth muscle cells again, those cow heart cells. Um, on top of the chip as well, and what you can see here at the edge is the packaging materials that just shows the ed the edge of the packaging materials, and you can see some artifacts in the signal acquired from these packaging materials, which could also be used just to calibrate the lighting conditions of the chip. Um, and so here you have the image of beads on the surface. In fact, this texture that you see here are actually the individual pixels involved, and then you see the the pixelated image acquired from the contact imager. And then we can superpose those two to show that there's really essentially ideal registration between the contact image and the photomicrograph. In both cases of this relatively easier dry case of beads on top of chip, as well as the real in vitro cell culture case, where in this case, I should have pointed out, the cells are these little red clumps. These cells have been dyed so that they're red. So there's one little red clump of cells there, and another little red clump of cells there. And so you can pretty much, you know, ideally pick out those two little red clumps of cells through, project, through this projection imaging. And I took away the slide that shows this, but we've done some further experimental and simulation work that shows that um, you really can get reasonable resolution and um, 
and imaging of these cells within a few hundred microns of the surface. And so in the context of most microfluidic devices, which generally aren't more than about one or two hundred microns deep, you really can use this as a pretty, um, pretty realistic um, imaging modality without any optics whatsoever. Right? You don't actually need optics in most of these microfluidic systems, is what this is showing. Um, so here's um, kind of the final, the final modality that I wanted to show you, which is fluorescence sensing. Um, many of you in the audience I know, um, know that fluorescence sensing is kind of the workhorse of modern cell biology. You know, anytime you want to learn something about a cell, you throw in a fluorophore and you start, you start measuring it. Um, generally speaking, you know, not most cells, many interesting cells of course, but not all cells are electrically active. Um, not all cells are anchorage dependent, so not all cells want to associate themselves with a surface on which you could measure attachment or something. And, you know, a lot of cells aren't even readily very visible. Um, so fluorescence is an important tool for studying cells in those cases that you couldn't address with some of the other techniques. Um, generally speaking, fluorescence is absorption of a short wavelength photon that results in emission of a longer wavelength photon. Um, the excitation light is generally pretty strong, but the light that you're trying to pick up is very weak compared to the emission light. So the challenge here is to get very low light detection and very good segregation of your emission spectrum from your excitation, sorry, your, yeah, of your emission spectrum from your excitation spectrum. And so uh, working with Elizabeth Smella, we've developed some um, pretty good um, detectors, and working with Elizabeth Smella, we've developed some pretty good, very thin organic filters um, that allow us to do this. So really what I'm showing you here is an integrated fluorescent sensor. This doesn't include the, the light source, but includes the detector and the filter. And, you know, literally the size, if you wanted to get down to the, you know, the real size of the business here is, you know, microns on the side. Um, you could thin this, you know, the, 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 the filter layer is a few microns, the layer of the actual part of the silicon that you're using for the detection is contained within the micron of the surface that you could thin. So really you could, within about you know, 50 microns cubed, um, get you know, a fluorometer. And so while we haven't done that, because there are a lot of other issues involved in actually packaging something at that level, we've packaged up some handheld prototypes and shown them to work in a variety of circumstances for a variety of di different assets. And so, you know, you can essentially, in, for many, many fluorophores, you can use just external light, either sunlight or an LED, whatever light you happen to have, as the excitation source. And then if you have good segregation between that excitation and the emission wavelengths that you're trying to detect, then you just use this kind of um, setup and you, and, and you get pretty good performance. Um, I, I guess I should point out that so this is this is a prototype that we built um, just to you know haul it around to conferences and meetings and give demos and it uses a standard cubette um, to hold the sample in for, for the fluorescence um, experiment. This one is a similar I think actually you can see a difference in color here and here. So these are using two di two different color filters that we've developed and this is actually using a custom well that was just a little well that we stuck on top. So it's using a custom kind of microfluidic well as a, as a sample. Just to show some of the variety of configurations that you can fairly straightforwardly produce. Um, okay, so I wanted to start with the technology, right? Here's what we can do. And here's a couple of things that we're doing with it now. So, you know, for a while I've been working with Elizabeth Snell in mechanical engineering on what we call cell clinics. They're really bio labs on a chip. Um, that integrate MEMS and VLSI so that you can capture cells, you can have instrumentation on the floor and monitor those cells um, in these little vials. You can either have lids on the vials that can, so that you can enclose a little microenvironment or not, depending on the application. Um, and, um, you know, I like to think of this kind of general effort as an effort to try to apply Moore's Law to cell biology. Right? There's a lot that we can do with the kinds of sensors that you can develop. And you can take a lot of cell biology measurements out of the lab and into either you know, the hands of clinicians or monitoring the environment or you know, ultimately you know, in implantable sensors. So we can, you know, the general approach, you know, the general kind of motivation here is to be able to start moving cell biology out of the lab and into 
applications that you couldn't address before, which is really exactly what you know, CMOS circuits have done for electronics technology over the last five decades. If you think about the, the variety of electronics technology that you have today versus what we had five decades ago, that's really what, where we'd like to be with cell biology. Um, and here's another project that we're working on, which is kind of one specific example, which is the use of um, elect monitoring of a specific kind of electrically active cell um, in order to develop an olfactory sensor, which is a nose on a chip. So um, the, the, the kind of approach here is based on the idea that um, anytime you really want to use an olfactory sensor for a high end application where you need to know the answer, and you don't need, and, and you can't tolerate false positives or false negatives or whatever. You haul in a dog. Okay, dogs are problematic as a sensing technology. Um, you know, we love dogs, but they're really problematic as your mainline sensing technology. So the technical approach here is to be able to monitor the the activity, the electrical activity of specific cells, olfactory sensory neurons, which you can get from, you know, which you can harvest from the nose or get from other mechanisms. Um, and um, use that as the basis for an olfactory sensor. So we're still working on proof of concept, proof of concept for the sensor, but um, I still think it's a very promising, uh, promising project. Okay. okay, so I wanted to share with you some ideas about where we might go in the future based on some of this work. Um, so just starting with you know, the idea of being able to develop new therapies, the general idea that I know people have talked about in the microsystems group, the microsystems initiative of the kind of human on a chip idea, um, where you could have an array of these little controlled environments and be able to use that for essentially high throughput combinatorial screening. You know, this is showing either um, you know, using a combinatorial approach to evaluate exposure time versus concentration for the same kind of material that the cells are exposed to, or using different cells, you could, you could expose different kinds of cells to dose and particle, different kinds of, sorry, this is actually, this is a particle there. Okay, so different kinds of particles to the same cells, but exposing different kinds of particles in different doses. Or, this, this slide shows different cells in the different lines with different doses and different cell types being exposed to the same thing. Um, and so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of richness in what you could do with this kind of high throughput combinatorial approach to cell biology. Um, you could also imagine this as being the basis for the development of personalized medicine where you take cells from an individual and use this kind of screening to be able to develop, you know, to figure out what works in, you know, for a, an individual specific cells, particularly if you think, you know, the way that those cancers are um, detected you know, the, the kind of course of treatment of many cancers is if you find the tumor, you go in, you take out all or part of the tumor, and then you got this tumor, you say, okay, well, you do whatever um, pathology you want to do on the tumor, but then you could take some of those cells and start looking at, you know, specific treatments for that person's specific cells. In addition, you could use some of this technology for developing handheld or portable diagnostic devices that would allow you to get um, to, to, to measure very specific cell properties for cells that you either collect in the field or you know other kinds of measurements that you that you take in the field. This just shows a sensor glued to the head of the seal using the seal as a as a mobile sampling device um, and sample preparation. Um, so sample preparation is also um, you know kind of at the at the limit of this um, integration between MEMS and VLSI, sensing and integration, sorry, sensing and actuation. So um, I think there's also a lot of richness in the kinds of, um, you know, given any kind of sophisticated sample preparation, you can actually improve the quality of your bioassays significantly. I mean, the limit in many bioassays, even in the confines of a cell biology lab these days, is in the sample preparation that goes into producing that experiment before it happens. Um, okay. And you know what I what also excites me a lot is the opportunity. So you know once you've got these, these sensors, and these sensors are literally microns on the side, um, and in many cases got very low power, you could use them for implantable diagnostics. Okay? You could use them, for example, if you go in and either take, do a biopsy or take out a tumor. You could, you could put a sensor there and monitor what's going on in that site without having to revisit that site later on. Um, 
you could, you know, another um, project that Elizabeth Snell and I have tried to develop over time and, or in, in the past is um, to use, um, you know, a, a constellation of sensors just to monitor um, the pressure in the bladder for, you know, a lot of, this, this is actually um, a, a very common syndrome which is not understood very well medically at present. Um, and one of the factors underlying the syndrome is just the ability to be able to, you know, understand what's going on with the bladder in terms of the pressure and whether they're coordinated contractions or whether they're essentially, you know, the equivalent of, you know, arrhythmia within the muscle cells in the bladder. Okay, finally, this is this is this is my my kind of vision. You know, back in 1966, there's this fabulous movie that many of us really loved, which is Fantastic Voyage, and the whole premise behind Fantastic Voyage is that there was this submarine crew, this, a submarine along with a crew of five, reduced to a size of one micrometer so that they, they could go into a person and remove someone, a blood clot in someone's brain in order to save their life. Okay, but if we can automate the sensing, we can automate the actuation, we don't need the humans. So, you know, I think that this kind of technology lends itself to thinking about, in the future, these kinds of miniature implantable medical microsystems we may not want some of these things floating around in the blood because there are other issues with floating around in the blood. But you can imagine a lot that you could do with implantable medical microsystems. And certainly things have been going in this direction for a while, but I think much more drastic miniaturization is possible. What I'm showing over here are a couple of examples. You know, one is the famous pill cam. You know, you know that these days you don't actually have to go through the whole process of, you know, the colonoscopy, you can just swallow a pill, right? And the famous story is that, you know, during one of the first public presentations of this technology, the person actually swallowed the pill and, you know, there was a running video on the screen, you know. <laughs> so I'm not doing that today. <laughs> um, you know, but it's, 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 you know, it's there. It, it exists. This is not, you know, this isn't, even, this isn't at all futuristic. Um, and also I'm showing one of the Bion functional um, stimulation devices, which, you know, its only purpose, really, it's two, two millimeters across by 16 millimeters long, its only purpose is just to activate muscle, peripheral muscles. And so it's just a functional electrical stimulation for, for muscles. Um, I think that, you know, given the, some of the sensors and technology that I've shown you, there's a lot that we could do in the space of about a, of a rice grain. And the space of about a rice grain is the size that you can get to most parts of the human body. A, you know, a radiologist could, you know, could tell you that you, you, know, you can biopsy almost any part of the human body with a little needle. And if you're down at the size of a rice grain, you can, miss with minimally invasive techniques, get this kind of monitoring into any part of the body you want. Okay. And so, you know, then the question is, what kinds of applications do you go after? What do you want to monitor? There's so many different kinds of sensing that one can integrate into these kinds of systems. Imaging, fluorescence, impedance, respiration, oxygenation, pH, cardiac cycle, muscular activity, cellular markers. I mean, you know, the list can go on and on and on, and it's just limited by, you know, your creativity. Um, not too much even by technology these days, and, you know, by the kinds of applications that you're interested in. Okay, so um, at this point I wanted to shift gear and, and, and talk about a little bit about another area that I think is um, a really exciting area in which we can learn from biology to improve technology, and that's the fact that biological systems, I mean, when you look in any detail at any biological system, what you see is that it implements adaptation and feedback almost at every level at which you, you, you look at it. Um, and I'll just share one example of that from my own previous work, which was looking at um, the blowfly um, photoreceptor, um, I, what, what I did was um, look at a linearized channel model of the blowfly photoreceptor, essentially um, looking at all the kind of physical pieces and linearizing them and expressing that as a communication channel model with all of these pieces in here um, kind of extracted according to the physical principles. And what you find when you do that is that, at least at low light levels, the, the the model and the data really show that you're operating pretty much close to the, the physical limit, you know, to the, the photon limit. So this, this curve is the, the limit given by just photon shot noise. 
And the, you know, if the, the actual behavior of the system only falls away at very high light intensities, where essentially you want to reduce your, you know, you don't want to let the system get saturated. So you want, so this is actually a desirable Okay, so what I want to show you now is, you know, I could actually, and the slides are still in there, so if you want to see, you can. But, you know, almost any of these boxes you can open up and look and see, okay, what does that do? What's the adaptation that happens inside that box? Any one of these boxes you can crack it open and look at that adaptation. I just wanted to pick out one in particular, which was the biochemical cascade part of this. The biochemical cascade um, in this particular system isn't actually completely understood. Um, but is generally modeled as this, um, it's called an adapting bump model. And the, the, the general idea is that in response to, you know, a, pho a photon or a stimulus of light, that you'll produce these bumps, and that the size of these bumps and the time constant of these bumps varies with the state of adaptation of the system. So what that does in terms of, um, in terms of a transfer function of the system is change both, so this is kind of, uh, this is that transfer function extracted from physiological data that shows that you're changing both the amplitude and time constant of this response as a function of how much light is hitting your retina. Okay, how much light is hitting. And so that's one aspect of how this system changes its own behavior in order to stay responsive to the environment. And in fact, you can understand this um, in terms of what function the retina serves. So, so what you see here is that actually at very low light levels, it has the highest gain. And that's a common feature across all of vision. At very low light levels, you want to increase your gain so that you can be responsive to what light you can gather. Okay? At the same time, in order to have that high gain, you pay a cost in terms of the time constant that you can, you know, you want to actually be more integrated. You want to not respond to the variations as much. You want to um, not respond to the photon shot noise and the noise. So you want more of an integrating response, a lower time constant. But then at higher, higher incident light levels, you want to reduce that gain so that you can still have the system not be saturated, still be responding to the light. Um, but, at, but then at those, at those higher light levels, you can actually afford to respond to the signals coming in much more quickly and get more information through the system. So that's a general feature that cuts across all of vision. But you see it when you go into the actual physiological data and extract the parameters in this kind of model. Okay, so now I want to shift a little bit to um, more of an engineer topic, topic, which would be adaptive mixed signal systems. Um, so I think it's important to study these kinds of adaptive systems that we can make because we can improve performance by canceling fabrication errors, by adjusting to changes in the environment, like changes in the light level that you might experience when you go from inside to outside or vice versa, for example. And in some cases, also adjusting to changing task commands. You know, what if, you know, when you go from low light levels to high light levels, you really want to change your response from being smoothing out noise to being more of a high pass response so that you can respond quickly to changes when that light water is coming towards you. Okay. Um, and so, um, I, I focus in most of the work I do on analog and mixed signal because they have a good potential for low power operation, for high speed operation, compact implementations, and for interface with the analog world in terms of sensors and actuators. And so again, you know, I just showed you one of the examples of these ways in which we found and you continue to find that biological systems exhibit this adaptation. And we want to be able to enable the kinds of systems we can develop to have the same kind of performance. Okay, so the general strategy that we take is to embed an adaptive system with some sort of inputs and outputs generalized um, into a feedback loop. And generally, we want to create systems that are able to adapt their own parameters and function autonomously and improve their behavior in whatever way you define. So I'm going to show you some examples of systems where we've done this. Um, the, before we get into it, though, the, the technology that it serves as the basis for most of this work is floating gate MOS technology. Um, floating gate MOS is a mechanism for providing non-volatile memory where you just have the gate of a transistor surrounded by oxide so that there are no leakage paths onto it. And then you can, you can store charge practically indefinitely. Um, this is really most commonly known for digital data storage. It's the 
fundamental technology underlying EEPROM, e squared prom and, 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 and the flash drives in most of your pockets. Okay. Um, and you can change that charge that's stored um, using a couple of kind of second order current mechanisms that normally we like to ignore, but we can just parade them out and use them when we need to. Um, these are hot electron injection for adding electrons to that node and tunneling um, for get for removing electrons from the node. From the node. And so we can create programming mechanisms where we use these in response to this kind of you know closed loop feedback system. So that's essentially the nature of all the following results that I'm going to show. Um, one of the first systems where we did this was just a very, very simple circuit, which is a comparator. A comparator is a really fundamental electronic circuit, and it does kind of what it says it does. It compares a voltage to another voltage and tells you which is bigger. That's what a comparator does. So this is a simple, one of the you know, very simple implement implementation of a comparator, just using essentially five transistors and a current source. There are two phases of operation for this circuit based on the state of this um, this control signal. Really, you're either resetting the circuit and letting you know and, and getting ready for the next evaluation cycle, or you're evaluating and latching an output to tell you which is higher. Um, the programming in this particular circuit it turns out to encompass the entire system from input to output, and that's why it's effective. In order to have these kinds of systems be effective, you have to have the kind of overall input to output characteristics. Um, the programming in this particular circuit as well um, just naturally engages when the power supply is raised. You don't have to do anything else in the circuit. Um, the pa programming happens in the circuit Whenever the power supply is raised beyond nominal values by more than about 300 millivolts. And in fact, that's why all modern CMOS technologies beyond, say, 25 microns can't use a 5 volt power supply. The power supply for any modern technology is determined by suppressing these current mechanisms. So we can just go a little bit above it to get as much current as we need. Okay. And you can make these things. So um, on the next slide, I'm going to show you results from um, a circuit like this where we either don't have floating gates for a fair comparison, or we have floating gates, or then after we program the floating gates. And so here are those three cases. So at the top we have without floating gates, so that's the fair comparison. And typically what you see in this kind of technology, in this kind of circuit, is a distribution with a width of about 10 or 20 millivolts. Okay? That's your limitation in being able to say voltage A is greater than or less than voltage B, is that 10 or 20 millivolts difference. Um, when you add in the floating gates, you pay a little price because you reduce your, your input coupling efficiency a little bit. So you pay a price in gain. So you see that your offset actually goes up when you add the floating gates. So introducing adaptation, if not done correctly, does screw things up. That's demonstrated. Okay, and then when you actually, um, when you actually, after you do the calibration, you see less than a millivolt of variation. And so it's a really effective, clear, in fact, one of the things I did for this presentation is the first time I've done it, this is, done this is just plot these on the same axis. I don't usually even plot these on the same axis because this is like one millivolt. Okay. Um, so we took this kind of basic idea and used it in a flash ABC. Um, a flash ABC is just a kind of analog to digital converter. And because now we have adaptive comparators, we can change the architecture of a flash ABC somewhat. A flash ABC is typically implemented with a string of resistors that provide the voltages you're comparing against. Okay? But now we have comparators that inherently can be programmed, so we can just program those values into the comparators. But, so we don't need the string of resistors. But that in itself is not a really huge advantage here. Um, what's really interesting in this case is A, that you can get very good performance. For a 6-bit converter, which is kind of you know, the proof concept system that we built, we got 5.9 effective bits, which is essentially younger. Um, the other thing that I think is very interesting and it is as yet not fully explored is that now that you've got this at you know, you've got these, this analog to digital converter that's inherently got adaptive components inside. 
And so now you can actually adapt the operation of your converter based on what you see going through it. And so one way in which we use that, maybe the simplest way in which to use that, is to just integrate it into a histogram equalization. So say, you know, in a lot of, in a lot of cases when you're using a data converter, um, you're not using all of the levels, right? You're only using a portion of your, of your voltage range or you're using some levels much more often than others. And so you might actually want to dedicate your voltage ranges where you actually have data coming in. And so that's, that's generally what histogram equalization does for you. And now because we can observe the operation of the system as we're going, and adjust the system as we go on, we can actually put histogram equalization in as an ongoing feature. Okay, and so, okay, I can, and there's just a picture of the, of the circuit. Um, so this is showing how we implemented histogram equalization. The basic idea is that what you get from the world, you don't necessarily have control over, and you'd like to be able to perhaps take some unequal distribution in terms of voltage, and be able to figure out where the levels need to go so that you can use all your bins equally. Um, we can implement that here just by observing where the bits are coming through and adjusting which levels get, which of these discrimination levels get programmed based on what bits are coming through, right? So we can try to shift the level in the middle to be so that it gets hit equally frequently. We can shut, you know, so, so essentially, what these, this, this signal going back in is doing is controlling when you enable programming based on the statistics of the signals that, that come through. And so, um, you know, so this, this shows it working, which essentially just says that in terms of signal, you know, however you measure it in terms of signal to noise ratio or um, mean squared error of the signal, that the mechanisms where you're allowing adaptation of that level and the adaptation of those, that performance, win over a kind of standard mode for using the ABC. Um, and this is just kind of the, the final thing on the data converter, which shows that uh, we didn't find any other reports in the literature of 5.9 effective bits, which is what this, this figure is showing, the 37 dB. I mean, that's, that's essentially the, you know, as high as you get in terms of um, uh, dynamic range in a, in a six bit converter. You can't go much higher. Um, so there's one other, um, there, there's another area that I want to show you, which is adaptive imaging. Um, we've used the same kinds of techniques that I just showed you to do mismatch cancellation in imagers. Um, big deal for a voltage mode imager, but where this matters is where you might want to use current mode imaging to do feature detection in a very small package or on the focal plane. But if you want a really small system that does feature detection, you want to do it by summing currents, okay? Currents are inherently not very well matched in these technologies, but we can use these kinds of techniques to match currents better. There are other techniques that match voltages, so we don't care about that. <coughs> all those cell phone cameras in your pockets have all those voltage cancellation techniques built in. Okay. Um, so we, we took that basic idea. So here, here is one, just an example from the output of that, um, <coughs> that mismatch canceling imager where you know you start off with a whole bunch of fuzz and you can't tell whether that's really a spaceship or, or what. Um, but it turns out that it's um, the sorry the Jefferson Memorial downtown. Um, so we, we took that idea and ran with it and used it to implement a single chip motion sensor. Um, uh, this motion sensor, so so the way that blowflies do it, the way that blowflies detect motion in their environments and can actually respond to and correct and try to get this down path, right? A blowfly is a little guy, and so it gets buffeted around by the air currents in its environment. And so the way that it can actually detect them and compensate is largely, at least at certain frequency ranges, through vision. And the way it does it is by detecting motion signals over a broad array, and then spatially summing those motion signals to figure out Am I being yawed? Which way am I being yanked? You know, kind of various kinds of motion cues that it might be experiencing. And so you get different motion depending on what you're doing in the world. If you're moving straight ahead, you see a lot of motion right in front of you. If you're turning around, you see motion at the periphery. You know, basically what you're doing depends on, uh, d determines the motion 
that, and that's, that's, that's the way that flies do it. Um, and so we developed this kind of um, mismatch can canceling imaging into a system that allows us to have a single chip system that computes these motion primitives. Um, and so here, here is just a layout problem. If you take, so the, the basic circuits that you use to detect motion, and that blood flies use, essentially most insects use too, are elementary motion detectors, which are essentially just delaying and correlating photo signals from the input. Okay, so it's just a delay and correlate mechanism. And the kind of circuit that you use to implement it is called an elementary motion detector. Those elementary motion detectors when you just measure their output, um, this is what you find. So this is just from an array of those detectors, and what do you see? You see that the distribution, the variability in the output is as big as any signal you're going to get. So if you wanted to combine these outputs over an array, you would get a tiny signal riding on a huge background that would be completely unrelated to your signal. And so if you really want to use this kind of, and so previously what people had done in the literature, in the field, was to develop motion sensors that would essentially globally sum signals like that to, to try to deal with that variability that you see. And so you've got an array of these motion sensors, but all you're doing is summing them together because of this, this stuff. Okay? But we can do much better if we can actually correct for that variability, then we can do these spatial sums so that we can figure out what motion the chip is actually seeing, or you know, whatever vehicle you put on is actually seeing. And so, you know, this just demonstrates that yes, to a very good extent, we can compensate for that, that variability. Okay, and so we took that system, we okay, so it was it was essentially a pretty crude system in the end. It was only 19 of these motion detectors spaced out about over about 70 degrees. You know, only two degrees of, you know, only two degrees of resolution between, um, and you know, really only about five degrees between the EMDs. So this is a really, really, really crude <coughs> implementation, proof of concept system. Um, and the filters that we used were essentially just kind of very low order, kind of, you know, the, the first filters you would choose in some sort of um, harmonic expansion. Okay, built it onto a a PCB board in collaboration with Sean, Sean Humbert over in Aero Engineering, um, used one of his robots in you know, a tunnel in his lab, and demonstrated you know, for the first time that based on input from a single chip, we could navigate through a, you know, a, re a realistic environment. And we think that the reason why this kind of goes to pot at the end is because um, at the end of the tunnel, you actually you lose the visual input that you're counting on to guide your so things do get a bit broader at the end, but while you're tracking through the tunnel, things are actually pretty good. So um, I just wanted to say a few words about where this might take us. Um, I think there's a lot of new kinds of non-vital high memory that different people are using, and so I think it would be natural to start extending some of these techniques into new non-volatile memory technologies, um, as well as more complex systems. I think of this project with the the motion sensor as our kind of first foray into, instead of just having a kind of simple component where you can really get at the input-output relationship and you know where the things are that you need to correct, but taking it to a higher level and just saying, okay, well, how do we put enough adaptation into the system at the right levels that we can do the correction? And it's, it's, it's really not a trivial problem. Um, and then, um, we've also used it to apply, we've, we've used it to apply to new kinds of systems. Um, for example, the kinds of system, this is a new thing that we're working on, um, which is actually the topic for David Sander's PhD, for those of you who know David Sander, um, he'll be graduating in the next few months. Um, using it to develop CMOS sensors to re replace photomultiplier tubes. Um, photomultiplier tubes are the gold standard for detecting very low light levels, but they have a lot of drawbacks. They're really big, they're really expensive, they're very sensitive, like if you put one out in, a, in room lighting, you either break it or can't use it for an hour. Um, they're sensitive to magnetic fields. They essentially, there are lots of things that break easily. There are lots of things that people don't like about photomultiplier tubes. And CMOS detectors are essentially robust in all the ways that photomultiplier tubes are not, but they don't have the noise problem. 
So if you wanted to use, to, de to develop the CMOS replacement for photo multiplier tubes, you know, the big thing that shouts out at you is you've got to control that dark current. In fact, the starting point is five orders of magnitude worse, which is almost embarrassing, but, okay, but you can do a lot, and in fact, we think we're within about a factor of two of photo multiplier tube performance at this point. Um, so the strategy is that you clamp the photo, the photo diode voltage. If you can clamp the photo diode voltage, then at least in theory, you don't get dark current. Right? If you can collect your photocarriers at zero bias voltage, you should have zero dark current. That is at least true with you. Now the trick is that your ability to hold that voltage at zero at the input is limited by the input offset of that amplifier. Okay? We know how to fix the input offset of that amplifier. And so now we can use adaptation in this system to really hold that photodiode voltage at zero. Which is, which is a new opportunity. And so um, here's a, so we're, we're just doing the tests now. I think the chip just came back this week. So th this is based on simulation results. But we estimate that we get a dark current suppression of two to five times relative to pin photodiode detectors, which are the, the, the scientific imaging equivalent for CMOS detection. And approximately 100 to 1,000 times relative to the cameras in your pockets. The CMOS, CMOS cameras and cell phones. That's what it was. And um, <coughs> the last topic I wanted to touch on, and I'll try to be brief here, is that I think there are also a lot of lessons to learn from biological systems in terms of power efficiency. Right? Clearly, biological systems have us down on this one because biological systems have been operating in the world under severe resource constraints. Um, trying to find mates, trying to find food, trying to escape predation for millions and millions of years. Um, and we haven't been trying to develop our engineered technologies for that long. Um, so this kind of brings us to one of the basic dilemmas of life, which is that you want to get the biggest benefit out of the smallest investment. Um, you want to get the best performance out of limited resources. And the way that the, the domain in which I look at this is in terms of how to make low power circuits, how to do low power computing. Um, the truth is that purely analog computing had its heyday, but it doesn't scale very well. Because purely analog computing, you can only add noise and degrade the signal. And essentially, the only way in which you can get better noise performance is by averaging. And so it just doesn't have good scaling properties for purely analog computing. Um, purely digital computing, waste energy because what you're doing at every stage of the system is having an attractor where you're using additional power to drive the states of your system to an attractor. Um, so but what I believe, and I guess this is conjecture, is conjecture is that somewhere in between is optimal. Um, and in fact, if you look at neural systems, they are using mixed signal approaches, mixed analog digital approaches to communicate information. Um, and so, um, I think that there's a lot to learn here in, the fundament, in looking at the fundamental trade-off between power and noise. Um, I know this is a bit of a stretch, but I wanted to take you down into a quick history of how you look at the energy cost of computing. And really, that takes us all the way back to Maxwell and Maxwell's demon. Um, Maxwell's demon, the whole point, the kind of story behind Maxwell's demon is whether we can violate the second law of thermodynamics by being clever. That you know, Maxwell postulated that you get this little smart either demon or a little valve here that can detect approaching particles, and only if you can detect approaching particles and tell whether they're hot or cold, you only let the hot ones through, and that way you can develop your engine, right? You only let the hot ones through, so you get all the hot ones on this side, all the cold ones on this side, so you've got a perpetual motion machine. Okay? Um, so the kind of the, the next slide kind of discusses the modern interpretation for this, which is that the act of sensing and recording that information is deduced or must cost as much energy as you could gain by letting those particles through. It's the kind of the, 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 the bottom line story. Um, the modern story in the energy cost of computing um, was really kind of laid out by Landau and Bennett, which is um, in terms of fundamental limits of computing, that information is re represented in the states of a physical system, 
and that any decrease in the entropy of that system has to be compensated by expenditure of energy. It takes energy to decrease entropy. Um, and then, you know, you can put numbers on it. The minimum entropy is kT log 2 per bit of information. And so the, the modern understanding of how this Maxwell's demon gestalt violates, you know, doesn't hold true with the second law of thermodynamics is that, in fact, you, you know, even if you could come up with a, an, a you know, a, a, a sensing mechanism that didn't require energy, um, at some point you would run out of bits in your queue, and you'd have to override the, the, the information in those bits. And so it's overriding and discarding that information that actually costs energy. So, um, so I, we don't think that the second law of thermodynamics can be violated by any other. Um, and then finally, Bennett really demonstrated, um, at least in theory, logically reversible computing, given, you know, essentially showing that you could construct a Turing machine that would um, erase its own output after it produced an answer. And so what that really showed was that no minimum energy is required for computation. If you can have the same state at the end of the computation as at the beginning of the computation, except for having your answer, then there, you know, that then it should be possible to find some system where you can recover all the energy you put in adiabatically to get back to the same state and not require energy. Okay, so what that means is that energy is only required to be able to drive this system forward and get an output. So if you don't want to wait forever, you might want to throw a little energy. Okay, um, then the story goes to real physical systems and it gets a little more complicated because most of the systems that we care about are dissipative systems. Certainly, biology and VLSI are both dissipative systems, and they both have noise. Um, and so, you know, I'm essentially just being honest with you. One of the way in which we've looked at this in these kinds of systems is by just posing those physical systems as communication channels and looking at this trade-off between information and power in a few systems. And so, literally, we we looked at you know physical channels, sorry, physical systems, and the transformations between variables and locations in a physical system according to a linearized channel model. And then looking at the kind of information rate or capacity that you get through that system based on the channel model you, that you developed, and then the consequent bit energy that is the power versus capacity for that system. So. Um, I'll skip this. So what I okay, well, so I can say a couple words about this, which is that this a, a couple of people in the 80s and 90s looked at this um, in terms of different kinds of signal representations, analog, mixed signal, digital, and found that there are different trade-offs for those systems in terms of the, the bit energy required for a fundamental operation. Okay, here the fundamental operation was just a delay operation, but that's somewhat irrelevant. And so what they found was that at very low signal-to-noise ratio, analog systems could be much more efficient, and that digital systems actually, once you reach some crossover point, which depends on your application, depends on the technology, that digital systems become more efficient. Okay, so I just wanted to kind of end this with, you know, where we are in this study. We've applied this kind of methodology to several kinds of systems. We've applied it to, you know, as I mentioned, low-fly photoreceptors, to silicon photodetectors and photoreceptors, to CMOS inverters, to some kind of simple CMOS circuits, um, amplifier, essentially single transistor amplifiers, multiple transistor amplifiers. We've also looked at extensions of this work, not just for looking at capacity, but looking at task-related performance. So if what you care about isn't necessarily just communicating as much information as you can about some signal, because not all tasks are like that, you know, if what you want to do instead is pick out a particular piece of information, then you can extend it into, in this case, we looked at a, you know, essentially the problem of, of flash detection in low fly vision. And, you know, found, it, found some other interesting results that that actually looks less like capacity and more like Fisher information. Um, but the, what I comment is that most of this work has so far been of an observational nature. And that I think the real failing so far has been that it needs to be extended into the design context and into more of a, an architectural 
um, and system level investigation. And I think that, 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 you know, I know that there are people in this audience that can help them move in that direction. And that's why I'm bringing this out here. Um, so at present, I would, I, would, I would posit that low power design, certainly in my field, is a bag of tricks. And pretty much if you want to make something that's low power, you pull out all the tricks you can and see what's best. And I just don't think that's a very satisfying state of affairs for where we are in society and for where, how important energy and low power design is. And I'd like to see this pushed further. Um, and certainly it needs to be pushed um, further in terms of non-sensory measures of information. Clearly, in many sensory systems where you can make the argument that what you want to do is just get information from some physical process into you know, wherever that information is relevant. You can make the argument that information is relevant measure for performance. But there are a lot of systems where that's not true, where you want to pick out a specific piece of information, or where you want to do some sort of computation. There are many computations that aren't, revert, that aren't logically reversible, right? Fourier transforms are log logically reversible because you can compute the input back from the output. But there are many kinds of computations, convolutions, that aren't. Okay, so just to take home messages, um, you know, we've been talking about applying principles from biology to engineering systems, um, essentially, and that's involved, involved a lot of integration of heterogeneous technologies, and I think we've shown a lot of um, benefit from incorporation of adaptation at multiple levels. Um, we've shown a lot of ways to measure cells and, <coughs> and novel circuits that improve state-of-the-art performance. So, I'll stay and take any questions, <coughs> and I wanted to take this chance to, um, to just um, advertise for the Microsystems Initiative. Anyone who hasn't been involved is certainly very welcome to get involved. Um, the goal is to create a community of researchers here at University of Maryland and in the general area <coughs> to generate new research activities, to um, you know, enhance our visibility because we think we're really good in this area and to um, hopefully provide tangible benefits to the people here at the University of Maryland doing microsystems research. Um, the kinds of activities that we've had so far have been largely collaboration building exercises like poster sessions and research speed dating. Um, we've had um, a number of seminars and more activities hopefully coming soon, including things like users community, um, peer, peer networks among labs, um, and uh, we've had a lot of discussion of the various grand challenges that we think this community is poised to address. Um, and so I just wanted to put in one final plug for the final microsystems seminar of the, of the semester, which is next week in this room at this time.